There we go. And the attendees are coming in now. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. We're live now. We're live. <laughs> 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 yeah, where is everybody? I don't know. I think we must scare them all. No, just, well, you should. People start coming in now. Yeah. Yeah. What time is it there in uh, Newfoundland? I know you, you have a funny time. It's just after two o'clock in the afternoon here. Okay. Right. Mm. That's uh, just after half past five here in Shetland. And it's still dark. It's been dark for a while. <laughs> dark and wet. So I think as people are uh, joining us virtually, welcome. Uh, you should see a couple people here on our on our screens. And if you can't see yourself, don't worry. You're not. Your cameras won't uh, turn on. Uh, but you should be able to in the chat function. Uh, just let us know where you're tuning in from. Yeah, that that sounds good. Um, how, can you see people, um, Dale, or is it no. all? No. Okay. Right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Andrew Jennings, and I'm in Shetland, and uh, I'm really not a very good knitter, it has to be said. But uh, I'm hoping that this event and others in future will help me to uh, expand my skill set. Um, there you go. So far. You see, what well, I mean, appalling, but there we are. Um, Shuan was asking me what I'm, what I'm knitting. And um, to be honest, uh, I didn't have a plan before I started. So it's more just to see um, what happens when I knit a square of, uh, of this wool and then um, combine it with some other uh, squares. And uh, I don't know, we have a thing in Shetland called a, a gravit, which is a, a, you know, a scarf. So it might be the start of a scarf, which of course is a very useful thing here uh, with the sort of weather we get, which I believe is very similar to the weather with you in uh, Newfoundland, certainly the, the eastern part of Newfoundland. We have um, a very windy, wet climate, which um, is ideal for, for wool and garb, because you can stick something wool on, and even if it get wet, gets wet, at least it keeps you warm. So um we uh we love to wear our, our jumpers so um i see dale's put a wee message there in chat perhaps people are um exploring how to use uh, the system it's a bit difficult to uh, type in chat while knitting at the same time uh, at least i find that a bit awkward but i'm going to put shetland in the chat there and i know i'm not alone because i can see shuan on the screen and she's in shetland a two, and she clicks. She says she's got some knitting with her um, as well. But she I do, it is. although it's, it's not particularly Shetland knitting, although it is Shetland wool. But I'm well, hoping to get to it later on. Excellent, <laughs> great stuff. Um, well, no one else has said where they, they might be, but um, we're a reliably informed that there are folk a, joining us a, right across the, the North Atlantic. Um, in a sort of transatlantic um, knitting circle. Um, and uh, the reason for this is that uh, Dale and Shuan and I are a part of the University of the Arctic uh, Northern and Arctic Islands uh, Network. And um, basically, just a little bit about this uh, network before I uh, tell you a bit, a bit more. So hang on just a wee second. Um, the, the network is set up to encourage people who live in North Atlantic islands like Newfoundland, Iceland, Faroe Islands, Greenland, Shetland, Orkney, Western Isles, um, and even beyond the, the Arctic into the Baltic, such as the Åland Islands or the Estonian Islands, to sort of get together um, to discuss shared 
uh, ideas, uh, to look for shared ways of, of, of working together, to um, research how we might ensure that our islands are uh, resilient uh, and dynamic uh, in the future. And um, we, we look at all sorts of things like tourism and population uh, statistics and uh, well, you name it, we look at it. But we thought it'd be a great idea if we did something um, sort of together, an event together that could bring people from the different uh, communities uh, together. Uh, something um, sort of uh, cheerful, friendly and relaxed that didn't involve a great deal of um, academic uh, challenge, but was actually fun uh, to do. So this is the one, this is the idea that, that um, we came up with, because Shetland has a tradition of uh, yakin and makin, that is people blethering together and knitting at the same time. And it seems as if every community across the North Atlantic has something similar. So um, we thought, would it be a great idea just to, to bring everyone together and uh, do it in a virtual space? I mean, I'd love to be in Newfoundland at the moment, um, knitting there. But uh, I'll just have to make do with sitting in my front room in Shetland. Um, but nonetheless, it gives us the opportunity to uh, share some ideas, uh, share some stories and uh, knit together. And we're hoping that this is the first of several so that um, we can have a, a, a knitting event in Iceland and in the Faroe Islands and hopefully one in Shetland, which will um, be at the same time as Wool Week, which is a big uh, woolly based uh, festival here in Shetland. So um, I have my knitting, as I said, I'm quite proud of that. There we go. Uh, um, I'll pass you on to, to Dale, uh, who's going to tell you a bit about uh, knitting in, in Newfoundland and, and share a story. And hopefully um, we can uh, see what the, the ladies are doing uh, there. And um, we can pass on some um, some hints of how to uh, improve my knitting knitting skills, um, and then also uh, later on, uh, Shuan will tell you about her uh, her life in wool and her woolly research that she's uh, engaged in. So, uh, welcome everyone. Great to to know you that you're out there and you've got your uh, your needles and your pins and you're working away on the wool. So, um, I, with that, I will pass over to Newfoundland and to Dale. Thank you. Uh, so welcome everyone. And uh, yes, the chat was disabled at the beginning, but now it should be up and running. And I see people uh, signing in from all over the place. Uh, fabulous to see where everyone is joining us in, uh, joining in from today. We've got over a hundred people uh, who are joining virtually. And you can see some of our knitters here uh, behind us in St. John's, Newfoundland are, are getting busy uh, at work. Um, I know someone noticed that their webcam wasn't working. Don't worry. Uh, all the webcams are disabled just for the, we only have the webcams up for the presenters. So you don't need to worry about your uh, webcams going on or off. Um, and if you have a, a question or a comment, you can, you can just place it into the chat. There is also a Q&A button there that I know some people were using uh, when the chat wasn't working. So just to let us know again, if you're just joining us, let us know where you're from. So I am here in beautiful, sunny, tropical St. John's, Newfoundland, uh, where we had a blizzard on the weekend and now it's been raining for the last 12 hours or so. Oh, it's, it's kind of clearing up a little bit uh, out there right now. I was just saying, if you're, if you're tuning in from Shetland, you'd feel right at home here with the weather, I think. Uh, and we are here at the AC Hunter Public Library. Uh, Julia, do you want to just come and say hello from the library? Uh, Julia is my my sister from another uh, another mother. He's my brother from another mother. <laughs> yes. We do all kinds of great programming at the at the library here. They've been wonderful partners with us with our intangible cultural heritage program. Uh, so Julia, who are, who are these people behind us? So the lovely ladies that you see coming in now are part of our knitters group that meet every Tuesday afternoon at two o'clock here in the library. They've been meeting here at the library for years and years. Uh, the pandemic put a little crimp in our style, but uh, we're back up and running again. And uh, it's an open, inclusive group welcoming knitters of all ranges of experience. 
and knitters or crafters of any kind. Uh, so if you were an embroiderer and you wanted to come and sit with the knitters, you're more than welcome to. They don't, uh, they're not prejudiced, I guess. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't know how they feel about crocheters though. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's okay. okay. It's okay. Yeah, they they yeah, accept crochets. Yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's one of our um, most steadfast groups that we have here at the library, and we're always pleased to host them. So welcome everybody, and we hope you're having a lovely day and doing some lovely knitting. And I see that we've got some representation from Newfoundland and Labrador here on this side of the Atlantic uh, in our chat, including some people who I know to be very great knitters. So they'll be knitting along. And uh, uh, we got people here from uh, other parts of Canada, and and uh, just let us know, yeah, in, in the chat section where you're where you're tuning. So in. welcome to Newfoundland. Welcome to Newfoundland. Um, I am not going to talk too much about knitting because I am not a knitter. Uh, we do have uh, uh, we have our one of our resident folklorists here, Tara Barrett, uh, who maybe a little bit later today will be uh, going around and seeing what some of the people are up to here and what they're knitting on. Um, so this is the yarns and yarns part. Uh, this is the yarning part where I get to yarn away about things. Uh, and before I turn things over, uh, we will, I'm going to tell you a little story, a little story. Uh, and this is how it goes. Not in my time and not in your time, but in a time long, long ago when everything was magical and pigs ran around with forks stuck in their arses asking who wants a slice of ham? There was a king, and the king dearly loved puzzles and riddles, and he let it be known that anyone in his kingdom could come to, to him and present him with a puzzle or a riddle, and he would try to solve it. And so one day, when the king came in, he found sitting on his, on his throne a box uh, with a note that said, uh, dear king, here is a riddle for you. Open up this box and, and discover the difference between the three things that lie within. And so the king opened up the box, and inside the box were three identical dolls. He looked at the first doll, the second, and the third. He couldn't find anything to indicate how they were different in any way. Well, said the king, I better call for the wise man. Surely he will know the answer to this riddle. So he called for the wisest man in the kingdom. And in came the wise man, and he looked at those dolls, and he studied them, and he said many, many wise things. But uh, all his words were empty, and the king realized that the wise man had no idea what the three difference between the three dolls was at all. So he sent the wise man away, and the king thought, I will call for my fool. Sometimes a fool sees things where a wise man does not. And so in came the fool. The king presented the challenge to him. And the fool took those three dolls and looked at those dolls and played with the dolls, juggled the dolls, but the fool could not find the difference between them either. And so the king sent the fool away. And the king said, well, I will call for my storyteller because she's heard many, many stories and maybe she will know the answer to this riddle. So in came the storyteller and the storyteller looked at those three dolls. And then the storyteller, who was also a knitter, reached down into her pocket and she pulled out a piece of yarn. And she took the first doll and she took a piece of yarn and she fed it into the doll's ear. And she fed it into the doll's ear and, and that is where it stayed, in the doll's head. Ah, said the storyteller, this doll is the doll of a wise person because everything it hears, it retains in its great brain. She took the second doll and she took a second piece of yarn and she thread it through the ear, same as she had. And this time it came out the other side. And she said, oh, she said, this is a fool for what goes in one ear goes right out the other one. And then she took the third doll and she took another piece of yarn and she threaded it in through the ear. And this time it did not stay in the head and it did not come out the other ear. It came out of the doll's mouth. Oh said the storyteller. This is obviously a storyteller. For what it hears, it must speak again. And the king said, but you've given me another riddle because when you put that yarn in the doll's ear, when it came out, it came out in a curl. Oh, said the storyteller, that is easy. For as every storyteller knows, when a tail goes in your ear, it comes out with your own spin on the story. And that was the 
end of the riddle, and if they're not dead, they're still living happily somewhere else. And with that, that's the end of my uh, yarn story. I'm going to turn things over to uh, Shua. Great story. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, why? That was amazing. Um, okay, I will um, share my screen here. And oh, I don't think I can actually. <laughs> um, I think screen sharing is disabled at the moment. Um, so um, I wonder if that can be. Yep. Sure. Great. Try that now. Thanks very much. So um, that was a wonderful story um, and uh, it's a great way to kick things off. Here we go. So um, I should start by saying that um, although the blurb says I'll be talking about knitting in Shetland, and I am in Shetland, I'm not from Shetland, as you might tell from my Irish accent, and I'm certainly not an expert Shetland knitter. I'm sure we've got some of those in our midst tonight. So I'll get to talking about Shetland, um, but I want to start with a wee story um, from elsewhere, from Ireland, because in a roundabout way, uh, this story is kind of what brought me here to Shetland um, eventually. So it's a story that is quite well known and it's often repeated as if it were factual. It's not, um, but the question of whether it's true or not isn't what interested me about it. I'm just intrigued by why this particular little story um, has proved so popular and so powerful. I want to know why people tend to want to hear and want to tell this particular story about knitting and investigating this was what got me thinking about knitting in a different way as something that could, could be part of academic research as well as part of my life as a knitter since childhood and it was that that eventually fed into my move from Ireland to Shetland. So I'll start by telling you the little story. Um, it's very brief and you may have heard versions of it before. It's a story about Irish Aran knitting. It's kind of an origin myth for the Aran jumper, which is this kind of very ornately cabled garment. And the story is a bit of a sort of just so story explaining why it has these ornate cabled stitches. If you've heard a version of it before, I'd love to hear about that later. Um, the same story is also told about different coastal knitting traditions, um, different islands and coastal places, but it's been firmly attached to iron knitting um, since at least the late 1920s. So the basic story is that a fisherman goes out to sea in a jumper that was knitted by his female relations. Trying to earn a living from the dangerous Atlantic Ocean, the man is lost at sea. His battered body, once washed ashore, is unrecognisable. However, his jumper identifies the corpse as belonging to his own particular family, and his family can then claim and bury his body. Sometimes this story is referred to very glancingly. Uh, sometimes it's elaborated with lots of added details, like maybe the jumper is a gift from a woman to her fiancé, or maybe additional stitch patterns are added to the jumper with each generation. And it's often told with a bit of a disclaimer that it might not be exactly true, but it still seems to need to be told. And not only in marketing contexts, so though it is quite a good way to sell jumpers, as we'll see. We'll see. In factual writing about the history of the Aran Jumper, um, you'll often see a tone of frustration with this story. Um, for example, when Alice Starmore um, wrote the preface to the second edition of her really classic knitting book called Aran Knitting, she starts it with the words, 15 years ago, I wrote this book with the intention of demolishing some of the myths surrounding Aran knitwear. But that kind of historically accurate myth busting has never been very successful. Um, I'm frequently told this story as if it were true, 
And this suggests that the power of the story isn't about its accuracy, but more in its dramatic and emotional and social properties. But it is also a great way of selling jumpers. So you do get companies marketing particular iron knitting designs as if they correspond to particular surnames, much like you get with Scottish tartan. Um, so that's what you see on the left here. And by the late 20th century, the iron jumper had become a really recognisable symbol of Brand Ireland internationally. And sometimes it was quite a kitsch sort of souvenir. But even when it's used in a joking way, I'd argue that it's an inside joke. I think this garment really does mean something within Ireland um, because we see it used in popular culture a lot, like in Derry Girls recently with Sister Michael in her Mighty Iron Jumper here. And it pops up in public sphere. It's used at things like political demonstrations around changing the constitution, things like that. So when people, even within Ireland, want to make a sartorial statement about Irishness, they tend to reach for this jumper. So through researching the stories and imagery surrounding Aran knitting and learning more about its history, I started to see the unidentified fisherman being named and claimed by his relatives as an allegory for the Irish diaspora being reunited with the land their ancestors came from, being recognised and claimed by the people there. The Iron Jumper as it exists today as a recognisable um, internationally um, known object was very much shaped throughout the 20th century by the interaction of two flows of people. Uh, people migrating from Ireland to America and then Irish American tourism to Ireland with an interest in genealogy and so on. So the Iron Jumper story carries ideas about kinship and nationality, with the islands standing in for the nation in a way that islands quite often do. Um, and to me, the story of the lost fishermen being found is a kind of fantasy of reunification, of homecoming, which has a very strong emotional pull um, for people on both sides of the Atlantic. So it's no wonder it's repeated ad infinitum. Um, to sell jumpers, but also as an entertaining or meaningful yarn between individuals. So the Iron Jumper Fisherman story got me interested in the kinds of stories that we tell about knitting. And I think that wee tiny apocryphal story contains themes that show up in different ways in lots of narratives about knitting, whether fiction or factual. They're part of what a writer called Joe Turney um, calls the culture of knitting in her book in that of that name. So one of those is kinship. Um, Joe Turney says that um, she writes about the notion of knitting as a sign of the familial. So if you want to give a sense of a family feel, um, you might build knitting into your story. There's something about nationality or ethnicity or group identity. There's something about an attachment to place and provenance, maybe especially um, around island places. It seems to pop up a lot um, in North Atlantic contexts. There's something about movement, that migration and tourism part, and a suggestion of changing socioeconomic circumstances. There's often um, the idea of a very harsh past, a past where people were really struggling to make a living contrasted with a much cosier kind of present where we're enjoying knitting as a leisure activity. There's a sense of loss, um, which commonly arises in stories um, around knitting. Knitting stories are often about things that people used to do that aren't done anymore. Um, if any of you knit in public, you might share my experience of strangers coming up and opening with, that's a dying art while pointing at you actually doing it. And um, I always remember this remark made by um, a knitting machine technician I was interviewing in a factory in Ireland who said, everybody loves the dying art. And I think there's something to that, that um, people like that sort of story, even if something's very much alive and kicking. There's also a lot around um, gender. And uh, as we've seen, men absolutely do knit and always have, but, the stories that we tell around knitting often involve women's domestic labour and everyday creativity. The idea that um, 
people are making stuff and exercising their creative brains all the time in quite sort of everyday contexts. And all these themes um, I can see in discussions of knitting in Shetland, as I learned when I moved here in 2016. So I thought I had to have at least one Shetland pony image, um, as Shetland is the land of sheep and ponies. So cutting a long story a bit short, um, when I moved to Shetland, it was extremely lucky for me that another anthropologist called Berenice Tonner um, was working at UHI and had already begun setting up a project in partnership with uh, an organisation that provides hand knitting tuition to primary school age children in Shetland. This group is called Shetland Piri Mackers, which means Shetland Little Knitters. I carried out a study on the question that the Piri Mackers wanted investigated, which was what is the value and meaning of Shetland hand knitting, because they had a sense that that had shifted. So the Shetland Perrymakers have uh, developed a method of teaching Shetland Fair Isle particular knitting techniques to uh, primary school age children based on the success of children's knitting groups in the islands of Walsa and Unce. Um, they have developed um, a very strong network of volunteers who are expert knitters who uh, go into primary schools and teach children. So it's very intergenerational. Um, they have developed a, a sort of toolkit, which they call a sock box, which goes with the tutors into school settings. And they're very keen on using Shetland materials and tools. So things like uh, Shetland wool from Shetland sheep, and Shetland Mackin belts, which is the tool that you wear at your hip to keep the end of your needles in. Um, and they are very much into um, enabling uh, children to knit what they want to knit. So here you see the knitting of a wee boy who's really into crabs, um, and he's knitted this crab design. The photo comes from the Shetland Perry Mackers Instagram um, because they also have uh, teenage ambassadors who handle their social media. I wish I had a teen teenage ambassador to handle my social media, but you should definitely follow them on Facebook and Instagram um, for a really good ongoing uh, window on the future of um, Shetland knitting. The Shetland Perry Mackers um, have had a really interesting mixture of funding sources as well. They've done some crowdfunding, they've done some European funding, and they've got private sponsorship, um, including from um, Alexander McQueen uh, after he, um, after that company um, had drawn on Shetland textile traditions quite heavily in some of their collections. So out of that work, I wrote a report called Shetland hand knitting, value and change. And um, some of the main uh, stories that came out of this work um, were about the idea of missing generations and the idea of a balance between Mackin and Yakin, if you like, between the actual knitting and talking about the knitting. On the missing generations, um, Christine Arnold has written about um, Shetland women uh, from older generations who learn to knit by what she calls maternal osmosis. So the idea that you just absorb the ability to knit um, from your female relatives. And talking to Shetland knitters, it's quite common to hear that especially older people can't remember ever not being able to knit or if somebody's telling me about their first memories of knitting, they might involve things like knitting children's fair isle mittens, which doesn't sound like a particularly beginner project to me. And it's common to hear childhood memories of small tasks like weaving in the ends on garments that were made through combined hand knitting and domestic knitting machine work, um, which fed into um, commercial um, knitting sales networks. So it was quite hard to avoid learning to knit during the mid 20th century growing up in an in a environment where that was going on. Um, but 
uh, things changed, of course, um, as different kinds of employment became more um, common, especially um, surrounding the arrival of the North Sea oil industry in the late 70s, early 80s. And so interviewees said things like, um, when I was young, everybody was knitting for commercial gain. Um, there were so many knitters, you could put an advert in the paper, I'd just give them a bag of colour and a swatch. But obviously, um, that's no longer true. And uh, Shetland Perrymacher's tutors all agreed that um, teaching people knitting to produce garments to sell probably isn't viable um, because they said hand knitting is really never a thing you can be paid for anymore. So instead, continuing social and economic change produces new ways to value hand knitting and the kind of contemporary creative economy around hand knitting is driven less by producing objects to sell the object and more by what one of the interviewees called talking about it. So that might be through blogging and social media, um, it might be through patterns, teaching, tours, all of that stuff. And while that can contribute to worries about losing actual physical skill, it gives lots of new ways for individuals and Shetland to benefit from the skills that were once everywhere and quite taken for granted and are now a bit rare um, and respected. So the Shetland Perry Mackers are trying to fill in those missing generations by providing their volunteer tutor network. So I eventually started thinking about the place-based knitting Shetland and Ireland together as two examples of localised knitting cultures that have a lot in common. As you can see from this quote on the right there from an Irish knitter in Donegal in 2001, she even remembers how they all knitted Fair Isles in Ireland until the 1960s when the musical group the Clancy Brothers appeared on the Ed Sullivan show in their lovely jumpers, which they also wore on all their album covers, and they gave Aaron Knitting a massive transatlantic fashion boost. So thinking about Shetland and Ireland, in 2018 and 19, I got a little bit of funding from the Carnegie Trust for a small research project looking at both um, knit industries comparatively. I wanted to look at how skill was understood and how skills were shared by people working in the knit industry in each place. And because I'd focused so much on hand knitting with the Shetland Perry Mackers, I was keen to look at it more broadly um, because there's a really uh, interesting kind of interplay between handwork and machine work that goes on in, especially in small knitting businesses in places like this. So I visited all the sites indicated here um, from Shetland through Fair Isle and over to the west coast of Ireland to Donegal, Galway and Inishman in the Iron Islands. Um, so I'll just show you what I mean <laughs> in Shetland, just to give a quick idea of some of the types of uh, knit making that goes on um, in Shetland's mainland island. Shetland College has a textile facilitation unit, a sort of mini factory on the left. There are some uh, small knitting factories like Jameson's of Shetland in the middle here. And there are lots, lots and lots of um, designer maker businesses, mostly um, one person designer maker businesses, such as Baca on the right there, there are many others. In Fair Isle, which is one of the Shetland Islands, um, Fair Isle has a population of just about 55 people. But within that 55 people, they have a really amazingly wide variety of types of knitting going on, including um, a sort of unofficial co-op, which um, makes knitting using sort of hand frames, simple machinery. They have a luxury knitwear business, um, Matty Ventrion, um, which makes different ranges in different ways. And they have um, individual designer makers, um, some of whom uh, make things in with a really cheap to shawl level of hand work throughout. And in Ireland, there are small factories like in the Aran Islands on the left here. This is um, the company's Quital Inishman, Inishman Knitting. 
um, and you can just see the factory across the stone field there, which is very characteristic of the Iron Islands. Um, there are iron style jumpers on sale anywhere that a tourist might visit, like in the city of Galway in the middle here. Um, those jumpers may have been made anywhere. Um, there are all sorts of um, mass produced irons coming in from all over the place. And there are also individual designer makers like Adele McBride on the right, um, who's a contemporary iron designer and teacher. So eventually, um, and it took a while, <laughs> this um, study uh, resulted in two um, recent articles, and one is on the theme of authenticity, and one is on the theme of creativity. So both are published in the same journal, it's called Textile, Cloth and Culture, um, and they're open access, so they're available. So today, um, not to get too academic-y, I'll, um, I'll just talk about how authenticity and creativity relate to knitting stories a wee bit. So this um, article about authenticity looks at how authenticity is um, understood within networks of people who make knitting in Shetland and Ireland in places that are particularly associated with fair iron iron knitting. And the reason that um, it's kind of hard to avoid talking about authenticity when you're talking about knitting, especially in um, these places, is the first thing people want to know is, is it true? Is this a tall tale? Um, is it the real thing? Is there a realer thing out there somewhere? Um, so those who are engaged in knitting, which is related to small islands in particular, are continually confronted with um, ideas about authenticity and demands for authenticity. And in order to, to operate um, within their very particular setting, people kind of negotiate um, what is real and what is good in their own context. So taking part in these very local knitting cultures um, also means that you're part of a kind of global conversation about what what your jumper is and what the real thing is because you're also part of the global market for knitwear and you're balancing your, your place in those um, markets and networks with your responsibilities to your immediate neighbours. So in this article I um, draw on the work of an author called Sarah Ketley who um, singled out different kinds of authenticity um, and I end up arguing that uh, Although a romantic kind of model of authenticity, um, and which is based on a very unified, idealised vision of place and people and product, all being very pure and one, and uh, what she calls an enlightenment model of authenticity based on evidence and integrity of materials and double checking where your wool comes from, um, those are very important um, in some ways, and they're important to the ways that makers communicate with customers. Um, and, but I think that within local networks of makers, what's really key is what Ketley calls relational authenticity, which is about um, good neighborliness, if you like, um, honesty and um, playing the game and not letting the side down and being um, a, both a good competitor and a good collaborator because within these very small communities you might be switching between being a competitor and being a collaborator if you're operating as part of a knitting industry. So getting on is, is quite important. Um, and there is a kind of danger in the obsession with authenticity. It can feel a bit obsessive sometimes of forgetting how creative knitting is. So this um, second article is about creativity. And it argues that for place-based knitting practices, so what we might think of as knitting traditions like Fair Isle and Aaron knitting, creativity is a kind of improvisation, a bit like jazz, where you can noodle around with the same theme in infinite ways. 
So this improvisation idea um, draws on the work of anthropologists like um, Svajek um, and Ingalls and Hallam. In Shetland um, and in Ireland, people often talk about um, expert hand knitters of the past as um, not using patterns or not using written notes. People, um, people remember their ability to work and rework um, inherited forms into innovative objects without a lot of, um, certainly without the kinds of very, very formalized, very sort of stylized um, patterns that we often use or see today. And within this kind of improvisational uh, kind of creativity, Svajek um, says that copying and reproduction are part and parcel of the creative process. So although we think of copying as um, somehow a bad thing or as not being creative or as even perhaps being deceptive back to the sort of tall tales thing, um, in this kind of creativity, it's the process of, of doing something again and again and again in different ways or in different contexts that makes innovation happen. And I think you really see that happening in places like Shetland and the west of Ireland around knitting, because these are places where different kinds of knitting and different kinds of knitters coexist and interact. So you've got manufacturing going on, you've got hobby craft, you've got craft tourists visiting different places, you've got globalised high street brands taking their inspiration from these places, you've got luxury fashion houses doing the same. And innovation happens when designs and practices pass between different kinds of knitters and different kinds of knitting. So hand knitting patterns and industrial software programs help this process along, as do the stories that people tell each other about their knitting. And just to make the point about the crossover between hand and machine stuff, the image on the left is the handwritten notes and freehand drawings on the wall beside a big industrial knitting machine in the Jameson's factory in Shetland. So just to conclude, um, as, this, um, as this network has identified with its name of Yarns and Yarns, knitting and talking or storytelling really seem to go together. And we can see this in common names for knitting groups, which include Debbie Stoller's revolutionary Stitch and Bitch movement. It's more polite, maybe more British cousin than Knit and Natter. And in Shetland, um, Mackin and Yakin, which is my favourite. So I'm going to stop Yakin now and hopefully start Mackin. So it would be fantastic to hear if um, any stories from other places or practices um, are coming to mind. And I'll stop sharing my screen. I think you What sort of knitting are you doing yourself? Um, well, it's not very, it's not very Shetland. It is Shetland wool, at least. Um, but it's all one colour and it's a, a top down, so not very Shetland, um, seamless uh, jumper. Sounds good. Sounds really good. I'll, I'll have to see it. Uh, how long will it take <laughs> you to knit it? Uh, way too long, I expect. <laughs> um, I'm wearing one which took donkey's years because I had to work out how to do it because I wanted to have like an ECG um, line. Um, so that was a pain. Excellent. Oh, well, great. Well, that was smashing. It was, I, you know, I, I sort of, I, um, I knew generally the sort of things that you've been involved in. It was great to hear the, the, um, the more about uh, your anthropological work in, in Shetland and, and, uh, and the Aran Islands and sort of linking the two together, together and bringing up these questions of authenticity and creativity. Um, which are, you know, so central to a lot of, of crafting and, and um, industries that people take do at home. And there's been some really interesting chat uh, in the webinar, uh, it's not in the webinar, in the chat at the side. Uh, I don't know if you have a chance to have a, a wee look at that. Um, there's, um, let's see, there's Kate Dawson in Eriske is talking about uh, whether her knitting is authentic, although she's only been in the Hebrides for 32 years. And then there's uh, Anne, who's um, a, had, so she was lucky enough to volunteer with the, the Walsa uh, Piri Mackers. So some, some interesting uh, some comments and, and thoughts 
Uh, the Erwin's a new message just popped in, so I don't know if you have a wee chance to have a look at that. Um, yeah. It's great. We've, it's amazing we've got a Perry Mackers volunteer here. Yes. So maybe what we'll maybe what we'll do on our end is I'm going to turn things over to Tara Barrett and really? maybe just mm -hmm. see what some of the people in the room here are working on. That'd be great. Yes, please. At all costs. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. So what's your name? Linda Badcock. Nice to meet you. And what are you making? I'm making a scarf. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank I you. love that color. It's pretty, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's called Bluebell. It's kind of a periwinkle, really. Yeah. yeah. They say, uh, I'm, I'm going to knit to the end of the yarn, but uh, the, the rule of thumb, apparently, for knitting a scarf is you knit till you think it's finished and then knit for another three days. Three <laughs> days? <laughs> And where did you learn how to knit? Um, I guess I must have learned from my mother originally just to knit and to purl, but mom wasn't much of a knitter. She she knew how and occasionally she did knit something, but um, when I went to university, my roommate was quite an avid knitter and uh, I just sort of took an interest in it. And that was in the 60s when there were still a lot of Oh, woolen mills around in Ontario where I grew up and um, she my roommate also had a car and we went mm. to one of these mills and were able to buy wool it was actually wool for nothing practically <laughs> and uh, I just sort of that's really where I really started to knit and what brought you to the to the libraries group what brought you out to the to oh, the knitting goodness. I've been here since the beginning yeah it was, uh, we had a worldwide knit in public event at one of the provincial historic sites where I was working at the time. Mm. And uh, so it just grew out of that. Mm. Mm -hmm. And up next, who do we have here? Um, Janet Kelly. Nice to meet you. And what are you knitting today? Um, fixing a dropped stitch at none of us. <laughs> <laughs> One dog. <laughs> and how about yourself? How did you learn how to knit? I suppose my mother did, and uh, she we had a very large family, so she didn't have a lot of time. So uh, I pretty well taught myself badly until, <laughs> you know, over years I got a little bit better. How many were in your family? Eleven, yeah. And what age do you think you started knitting? Probably six, seven, yeah. And who were you knitting for today? Oh, me. <laughs> Nice. Oh, it was winter. <laughs> but the first thing I knitted, and I see other people doing the same thing, is they start off by saying, I'm going to knit this beautiful sweater. And <laughs> they don't know anything about it. I did that. That was the first thing you tried? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I did uh, Mary, these Mary Max and big heavy sweaters. And by the time I'd get it knit, I'd have to give it to one of the younger ones because I've already grown <laughs> out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and what is your favorite thing to knit? Socks. Socks? Because I have arthritic, arthritic feet, and this is better than any medication Ooh. to wear these. <clears throat> really makes a big difference. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we wear. Yeah, we wear them. Yeah, you wear those compression yeah. socks. And I for grandkids and stuff, the ones that are still interested, you know, mm -hmm. comes a point when they stop being interested, and then as they get a bit older, they're interested all over again. So. Mm -hmm. so it's uh, and having this group mm. is great because that's we spend a couple of hours a week with one another it's really mm -hmm. interesting yeah. and do you guys learn from one another um, as well yes. yeah 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 perfect mm -hmm. hi there what's your name hi my name is Anne Gardai and uh, I'm knitting socks and I like to knit two at the time with the circular needle and um yeah and I also learn to knit around six years old. My mom was 85, now she learned to knit at school. That's what they did back then. And I think I bugged her so much that eventually she said, okay, I'll teach you how to knit. Cause I think she thought I was too young. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I remember knitting sweaters for myself as a teenager. Kind of, it went away for a while when I discovered this group. I kind of rediscovered a love of knitting and learned so much because you see everybody using different techniques and learning about different resources. So it's very motivating. Yeah, I imagine, do you share patterns or say oh, like- Oh, yes. Yeah. And yeah, we help each other. It's just, yeah. And you had your knitting class at your school when you were teaching. Oh, yes. Well, I'm a retired teacher, but I did have a knitting group after school. And uh, mostly children around 10 years old, um, mostly boys were really interested in it. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, they really enjoyed it. And can you explain to me the, the knitting two at a time? Yes, so, any... well, a sock is circular, like, like Janet's doing one pair now with four needles. Uh, so this is on the circular needle, it's the same idea, but it's a long circular needle. So yeah, you can have the two socks at a time. So basically you're doing like, front back front back you just keep going around keep going around that's my preferred method that's i learned that i don't know when i joined the group i found a book at the library because awesome. i don't like the four needle so I was like this is for me <laughs> so you always <laughs> learn something new mm -hmm. and hi there hi. what's your name uh, my name is antonia mcgrath and i learned from my mother i think um and I was the recipient yeah. of one of the sweaters that Janet, who happens to be my sister, <laughs> knit and was too small, which was too small for her. And there's an iconic photograph of me wearing <laughs> one of those sweaters. So it was well loved and well used. Oh, absolutely well loved, yeah. <laughs> and what are you making here today? Um, <clears throat> I'm making a sweater. Uh, this is actually, actually, there's a, sort of an amusing story about this sweater. <laughs> sure. This sweater used to be an Aaron sweater, okay? And the woman who was knitting it was knitting it for her husband. And then she found out that he was having an affair with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so she ditched it. <laughs> and and we often bring in, you know, extra wool and things like this. So she, she, she brought Got in it. a lot of wool and I jumped on it. But my knitting is not, it's not good enough to have completed the sweater. So in the end, I had to unravel it. And it killed me because it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, so it's just a straight up, what you call a jump, what they call a jumper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and did you knit your, your cowl or your? Uh, no, but somebody in the group did. Nice. Uh, yeah. So it's, this was the, it's supposed to have a, yeah some um ukrainian ukrainian yeah oh like the yeah. sunflower and sunflower. Then the colors yeah. beautiful yeah okay anyway, thank you throw it back to the yeah to the crowd <clears throat> so maybe we'll do uh, i know people have been asking some questions so they can making some comments there in the, in the chat. I don't know if Andrew or Shun, do you want to address some of those things that people are saying in the chat, maybe? Um, I'm reading all sorts of really interesting things in the chat, um, including a recent comment about um, the idea of being an Islander by choice and um, knitting in, in the style of different islands. Um, and I suppose those those authenticity questions come up again and again. And uh, I think um, lots of uh, lots there, there's just there's so much um, creativity around to play with, if you like. And the uh, the sense of um, particular places as very sort of rich, um, rich repositories of skill. Um, I suppose you can think of it as um, things do evolve and um, places like Shetland um, have always been really innovative in their knitting and have responded to all sorts of changing conditions and changing markets. And um, I suppose I, people have uh, 
really different ideas. And as somebody said, there are very sort of delicate questions in some island groups in particular about, um, about islanders and islandness. Um, but I think that one of the things I find with um, questions about exactly what is authentic or how we sort of draw a line around what is authentic, it becomes um, a bit of a, a receding horizon. You know, when you think you've, you think you've found the most authentic thing and then there'll always be something that's even more authentic, but they've just stopped doing it um, or it happens on the other island. And it reminds me a bit of a, um, a famous short story that some people, if they're into islands, might um, know about by D.H. Lawrence, about the man who loved islands. It's a story of a man who is obsessed with um, finding the perfect island. So he moves to smaller and smaller islands because no, no island is pure enough for him um, until eventually he's on an island where he's the only inhabitant, but then he still finds it's not enough because he's he's... Um, he's driven wild by the the elements and the weather and so on um, and I think uh, what is sort of um, interesting and useful about the authenticity stuff is what people do with it and I'm really interested in seeing how people use it and the ideas people share about it and how people kind of negotiate that stuff between themselves um, but it's never it's never really possible to just sort of draw a black and white line between um this is the real thing and there's no realer i, I suppose uh, authenticity also comes down to sheep as well and to wool and the sort of uh, the raw materials um and um Sh shetland wool has been um well what's the, the official uh, title it's got shown it's got uh, it's been officially recognized as a as a unique um, brand, I'm sure somebody in the in the chat is saying, oh, "Why does he not know?" So I'm, they'll put it in the in the chat and put me right. Um, but I, I was wondering, uh, somebody mentioned Newfoundland sheep, so I, I wondered if uh, if the ladies there are using Newfoundland wool, if there's a special kind of wool for special uh, garments. No one's hearing me. <laughs> I'll have to shout louder. Newfoundland. <laughs> um, it's uh, ah, right, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, I think the 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 general consensus here is that uh, there isn't a lot uh, of people using uh, Newfoundland wool. I know a lot of the a lot of the sheep farmers here just just throw out their wool. They don't they don't use it at all. Um, and people were saying like a lot of the wool that people get here, they're getting from Briggs and Little, which is Prince Edward Island, is yeah. that? New Brunswick. New Brunswick. New Brunswick, yeah. So a lot of it is brought in, even though we historically did have uh, a sheep industry here and there were carding mills here. Um, yeah, it is, it is something that I think we, we as people who are interested in maintaining living traditions uh, are really kind of interested in because we, we would love to be a bit more self-sufficient in, in some ways. I might turn things back over to Tara and we might have uh, some comments. When you're talking about the wool, back in the 80s, in the mid 80s, I heard that some people from Scotland or wherever came to Newfoundland and said that our wool and our sheep were too coarse and that our wool wasn't good. And that's why the farmers started to throw out their wool because okay. then the Newfoundland did not use the local sheep's wool. Well, I suppose if it was coarse, it would be good for some kind of uh, garments and not for others. So. <laughs> but back in the mid 80s, I would say the mid 80s or the early 80s, they, there was people from Scotland or somewhere came to Newfoundland and said that our sheep, the wool was too coarse and that our wool wasn't any good. So that's why our farmers stopped bringing the wool to the mills because they were told, and the Newfoundland people, they thought like our wool was too coarse and too rough. So they stopped using it. And then they started using 
industrial stuff. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's any truth to it, but obviously it has to be because we don't have our, um, there was a wool mill here and they shut it down. So I don't know if that's the reason why, mm -hmm. but that's what I was told back a lot of time ago. I'm not that old, but. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you knitting here today? Um, I'm knitting socks. That's what I usually do. That's like my little. Yeah. Your go-to. Yeah. And we do use Briggs and Little. I also weave and I use a lot of Briggs and Little, Little when I weave, like I, I can order it by cones, like or I haven't lately, but you can get it by the cone. So I will use Briggs and Little to weave. And I do knit sometimes like the, the socks and mittens from it. And does anybody here have any recollection of their mother spinning yarn or carding yarn? No recollection at all? My my husband, my mother-in-law did that, but I didn't know her at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, when wool became commercially available, they threw away the spinning wheel. Wow. My great-grandmother had to spin wool. Well, they had maids in the firm. Um, they had to spin wool to knit long johns. And that because obviously we're going back like 100 years, they had nothing, right? I do know how to spin as well. I have a background in textiles. So. Mm. Now, for anybody, did anybody have any recollection of their mother or grandmother sending wool away? Because I know that was something that was often done. You have your hand up over here. So you have recollections of your mom sending wool away? Yes, we used to have our own sheep mm -hmm. and we'd share them. And my mother would um, send it away and then it would come back in skeins. Mm -hmm. And we'd do this, you know, for mom to get it into the ball and then she'd knit it into uh, the mittens. And do you know, I know I've heard of that being done by Briggs and Little. Do you know if it was done by Briggs and Little or another company perhaps? I can't remember. No, I know it used to be sent away and then it would come back. And your family had sheep themselves and then they would yeah. shear them and send them away. Yes. Yeah. We didn't have a lot, but enough for like us to have our own. And where did you grow up? What community was that? Out in Clark's Beach. Clark's Beach. <laughs> we did a we did a sheep shearing uh event or we went out and sh uh, helped shear some sheep in well it wasn't clark's beach wasn't it Mother? yeah 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 a little while ago yeah. end it there yeah okay. okay so maybe we'll turn things back to uh you andrew uh to uh wind things up so to speak Thanks, Dale. Uh, I've managed to knit a bit more of, of my uh, thing here. So it's actually, uh, wow, it's a, it's a great experience knitting and listening, and I wish I'd done it before. Um, I learned to knit when I was at school. Uh, we had to knit um, sort of, um, what was that, the handicraft thing. I was inspired actually more by my, my, my dad when we lived in Iceland. He um, picked up knitting Icelandic jumpers, and um, he liked to do it with the uh, the sort of it was spun wool but it was in it was still in hanks so it wasn't spun into um you know balls of wool and uh he would get as many of these so you could knit them together to make indestructible icelandic jumpers that you know were bulletproof so uh we've still got some of those so my aim is to um sort of achieve something similar in, in due course but uh well i hope everyone's enjoyed this uh, opportunity just to um, you know, hear some yarns and uh, listen to um, that really uh, fun um, story from Dale. I'll remember that one and uh, for the really interesting information from, from Shuen. Um, and also from the information, it'd be great to be able to capture some of the webinar chat if possible, because there's some really interesting stuff in, in there. People who are working um, with wool and with sheep and are um, avid knitters. So it's a really um interesting things there so i'd just like to uh, thank everyone for taking part and particularly um the, the ladies there in in newfoundland um for letting us uh, share your um your sort of your quiet time your your sort of your you time it's been really really good and to hear your stories about as well about uh, when you uh, learned to knit and um this is i say the, the first of several of these you want to make a um, a habit 
of these transatlantic uh, knitting circle e events um, so that we can hear from other, other people and other groups in other places. So if there's anyone listening to this or, or has been watching or be perhaps watching a recording who would think, oh, my knitting group would be a great one to, to host uh, an, an event next, then please uh, let us know. And um, I say thanks again and, and keep knitting. And thank you very much for Dale for uh, organizing this. Uh, there was a there was a question in the chat about whether or not this was being recorded uh, and fingers crossed i think we have recorded it uh so i know we'll be posting it on the heritage nl facebook page certainly so you can look there um and i'm sure andrew if you pop whatever email you want into the chat uh, if you let andrew know uh, we can circulate uh, a link to wherever it ends up being hosted uh, and you can watch it again or share it with your knitting friends. And if you're in St. John's, Julia, maybe just to end up uh, back where we started, if people want to come join some knitters here at the AC Hunter Library in St. John's. Yep, we're located here in the AC Hunter Public Library next to the Arts and Culture Centers here in St. John's. We meet every Tuesday from two to around 4.30. It's uh, kind of very loosey-goosey. Bring your uh, knitting crafts and your thread crafts and uh, come and join some really wonderfully experienced ladies and gentlemen who come together every Tuesday afternoon. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.